Are we all set? Sounds like it. Okay, welcome uh, back to this public meeting of the Board of Trustees of the Palo Alto Unified School District. The board met in closed session uh, uh, this evening and just returned and uh, took the following reportable actions. The following employees received satisfactory evaluations for the 2021-22 school year the Assistant Superintendent of Education Services Elementary, the Assistant Superintendent of Equity and Student Affairs, the Associate Superintendent of Educational Services, the Chief Business Officer, the Deputy Superintendent, and the Superintendent of Schools. Um, I wanted to say before we started, the, uh, before I uh, proceed with the agenda, um, that I at least found personally shattering the news from Texas today of the slaughter of those um, students and their teacher at the elementary school. And, you know, it's, I think it's doubly shattering attending a school board meeting and presiding over a school board meeting um, with that having happened. Um, I wanna obviously remember those students and their teacher. And I also want to um, uh, point out again, the complicity of those politicians who are um, trading the blood of members of our community for political support. Um, it's, I think, no accident that um, Donald Trump and um, Greg Abbott and uh, Ted Cruz are going to be attending the meeting of the National Rifle Association in Houston, I think, this week at which they'll collect the political support that is being paid for uh, with those lives. So I think we just need to redouble our efforts to uh, get real gun control in this country. Students should feel safe at school, um, and now they can't. So I think that's tragic. Uh, Mr. Dauber, if, um, if I have something to add to that, is board operations a good time to do that? Uh, sure. Okay. Okay, let's, uh, thank you for uh, indulging me with that comment. Let me uh, now, uh, proceed back to the agenda. Um, and the first item on our agenda is the approval of the agenda order. I move to approve the agenda order. Second. Student board members, preferential vote. Aye. Aye. Board members, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The agenda order is approved. The first item on our agenda is the last uh, of our student board member reports for this uh, year. Shall we start with Ms. Acosta? Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. So um, in the last few weeks of school, Pali has had and are continue to having a lot of events to kind of wrap up the school year. Um, first off, junior senior prom was on the 14th at the Exploratorium, and it was a very fun experience being able to play with all the exhibits and dance and have a good time with our peers. And um, something that was even better about it was that the event was not a super spreader. Um, <laughs> I think the week after prom, we had around 30 cases in the entire school, um, which, was, which was really good. And I was really happy that everyone was staying safe. Um, secondly, the last site council meeting was on May 16th, uh, where they wrapped the school year up and the uh, site council meetings up with opinions from students, staff, parents, et cetera, about how to improve next year and how to improve communication uh, throughout the school and with uh, the rest of the community. ASB held teacher appreciation card making on 517 and ASB um, put the cards in their um, mailboxes uh, the following day. Pally had a choir concert on the 18th. Um, there was also an instrumental concert on the 19th. 
as well as the third Quadcella Day, where there were solo, solo performances from peers, and Pally's Kazoo Club performed a song, which was really amazing. Um, on the 20th, we had Pally Play, um, which was an extended lunch where we were given barbecue, and there were games on the quad, such as spike ball and volleyball, and there was a class-wide competition that the juniors won in. It was a fashion show competition. Um, SJP had their junk couture fashion show on the 20th, and last week we finished up AP testing. As for upcoming events, we have the senior award ceremony on Thursday the 26th, um, senior signing day for athletes who are playing at the college level on the 27th, as well as senior celebration where the school comes together and we have dancers and speakers. Um, uh, we have yearbook distribution tomorrow. Um, the juniors are ending their junior year strong and starting off with their class unity for senior year, coming um, with various dress up days. So on Friday, they had a movie character day, and on Thursday, they're going to have um, what they call Toes Out Thursday, where they wear sandals to school. <laughs> As for publications, uh, CMAG released a publication today. Campy released last week, and Verde is releasing this Thursday, and we'll be passing out um, copies at graduation. And finally, graduation is on June 1st at 5.30, which is very exciting for the class of 2022. Lastly, as it is Annika and I's last board meeting as the Gun and Pally board representatives, um, I personally want to thank PAUSD for giving me, alongside other students, the opportunity to represent our schools at board meetings and kind of get an inside look on how the district runs. I also want to thank Pally um, for an amazing high school experience, as well as the board and the rest of the school district for welcoming Annika and I this year and working with us. Um, this year has been amazing, and I can't wait to see what the future board reps do. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Bernie. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, we're, under, we're nearing the end of the year. Um, very near, in fact. This week is senior finals, and next week, Gunn will be holding graduation for their seniors on Wednesday, as well as finals for all the other students. Paper toss is this Friday, as well as senior sunset. Senior showcase where seniors will be recognized for their work these past four years will be held tomorrow. Um, and the yearbook, which the yearbook staff has been working tirelessly on this past year, um, will be released tomorrow. The Oracle released their final issue of the year last Friday, with next year's staff stepping into their new positions. And the Oracle Senior issue will be out this Friday, celebrating our seniors and offering insight into what they'll be doing in the future. In sporting news, our baseball team is still in CCS after beating Gunderson 11-1 to on Saturday in the first round. They have a game today. I don't think that game's finished yet, but fingers crossed that they're still going. Um, seniors Sharona Schwab and sophomore Avery Edelman qualified for the CIA, CIF state track meet in Fresno this Friday, and I joined Gunn in wishing them good luck. I also just wanted to take a second to acknowledge the passing of one of Gunn's beloved teachers, Miss Laurie, known by staff, parents, and students alike as a very kind teacher who would always go out of her way to help students and foster their love for physics. Her loss is just immeasurable, and she'll be very dearly missed. And then finally, like Micaiah said, due to this being our final meetings, as the student board representatives, I just wanted to thank everyone that I've, that I've met and worked with at the district, on the board, and at Gunn. It has been such an honor to serve in this position, and I'm so grateful for everyone that has helped me along the way. I wanted to specifically give my thanks uh, to all of the students at Gunn that I've had just the absolute honor of representing this year, and I want to thank them for trusting me to do this job and for being the best group of students who I could have ever had the pleasure to represent. It's been a fantastic year, and I know you'll be in good hands next year with Daniel Pan, who will be taking over for me as my successor. And so it's been a great 13 years in the district, and I know the class of 2022 is excited for what's next. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll miss your report. Um, and uh, fortunately, uh, the next item on our agenda is student board uh, representative recognition. And 
So that's the moment where we get to say thank you for your service to the board and to the students of the district and really to the community. Um, this is the way that um, students in our high schools have their voices heard at board meetings. Um, and it's an important position. It, this isn't a position that we dreamed up. This is a position that the state education code um, authorizes um, because of the importance of the work that you are doing to the decisions that we are making um, at this level. And I also understand that um, what we're seeing here is the tip of the iceberg that you've spent a lot of time consulting with your fellow students about the issues that are going on in the district and you know, informing yourself about uh, the implications of the decisions we're making for those for your fellow students and we deeply appreciate that it's extremely helpful um, to us to hear your input so thank you for that um, it may not be obvious to you when we don't agree with you with your preferential vote but we are always listening and always learning so thank you for that um, I have presence and when I say I I want to thank Vice President DeBranza because these are excellent presents you are not in the position of board reps uh, when I was the vice president. So, you so I'm pretty sure I didn't <laughs> Yeah, it could be that Ms. DeBranza took care of this that time. Um, so uh, you're going to love these. And let me pass them to you. Let me pass them down. You guys helped us with the shirts. Yeah, thank you. And they're just a s small token of the appreciation that we have. Should um, we open them? Sure, you can open them. Yeah, go ahead. Is it okay if we talk about you while you're opening them? Okay, <laughs> great. I just wanted to echo, I think probably you'll hear from all of us echoing thanks, but um, you know, one of you I've known since you were at Ohlone, and one of you I just got to meet this year, but you, the contributions that you've made to the board conversations and discussions this year um, were always really helpful for us. And uh, you clearly spent a lot of time educating yourself and deliberating and getting feedback. Um, and you just showed up here every time and spoke so clearly about your position and why. Um, and I appreciate it, especially your desire to bring Zoom comments back, because I think that that was very convincing to people. Um, so thank you so much. Good luck next year. We, we wish you all the best. And I'm sorry that you're still undoing those. I thought that was really cute the way I did that, but <laughs> might have been a little too much. <laughs> So yeah, you guys keep on talking. Someone I'll, else goes. I'll, I'll, add my, I'll add my comment. Um, <laughs> you both started as board reps back when I was president. And I know that that year, the, the beginning of the academic year, I mean, what a time to start in that position, right? That was the last three years, every year has been unique in its own way. And, and this school year was certainly no exception. And you, you handled it with, with a plumb, which can be an SAT word, but you handled it with a plumb. And it was... Uh, and a gravitas, I think, well beyond your years. So thank you for your, your contributions. Okay, anyone else? All right, thank you so much again. You guys can actually open them. You can open them. And... No pressure, but, you know. Yeah. There's... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. Okay, thank you so much. Let's move on to our um, the next item on our agenda, which is recognition of our Parent Teacher Association Council President. Um, Dr. Rossin, do you want to uh, start us off? Yeah, she's there. Christina, I see her, yeah. Christina's Christina. going to come to the podium, and I told her it's going to be a little awkward in the beginning, but she's going to stand there alone for a minute. <laughs> I will join you in just a moment. Okay, Christina Schmidt. So my 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 first note here just says simply a partner, and then it goes on to say even when things are tough, and that's when you find out who your partners are. Right? It's when things get tough. Always a smile and a can-do attitude. Even when there's there are questions, she leads with the beliefs, the belief that others have best intentions. That's a, such a great starting point, especially right now when that's not always the case. Christina leads without any personal request. She brings things forward, even if uh, 
they affect others and not necessarily her or, or things that she holds the closest. But she will bring them forward even if it's a different perspective from somebody else or a different group and say, you know, and she doesn't bring it forward and say, hey, here's this thing and I don't believe in it. She'll bring it forward and say, these people have a different perspective on a, on a thing, whatever that thing may be, and that's so appreciated. She's measured, measured and thoughtful in her communication and respects the importance of transparency in her positions and her decisions. Christina's a pro, a leader, a partner, and I have great appreciation for her as a person. So Christina, for me, uh, and I'm sure our board members are going to have some comments also. I just want to thank you for these last two years. I, and I, you know, as I've had these conversations with our board members, I think each board president has landed in the perfect time for them to be the president of the board. As we've gone through these different things, I think you were the perfect person to be our president during these hard times because they were hard and, and you were built for it. And I really appreciate that. So I want to Bring you a little something, and then we might have some comments here from board members. Thank you. I'm kind of overwhelmed here a bit. <laughs> and for once, without words. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Oh, it's me. I, I, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm deeply touched by this. Thank you. Um, this journey for the last few years has been unprecedented, as you all know, and no one could have told me this was going to happen in advance. Um, but one thing I do know is that we all rise together, that we educate our children together, and that every step along the way, you might see me here, but I'm representing every PTA person that has stepped forward throughout the last two years that has come out and said, I can, I will, no matter what, we're gonna get our kids back in school, we're gonna keep them there, and we're gonna make them safe. And that was the leading force of all of this. And I cannot tell you how grateful I am to have had this opportunity. There were days when I didn't feel that way, <laughs> but overall, when I look back, I have to say that it has been a journey that I have grown and I have been able to give so many people thank yous over the course of this last two years. So thank you. Thank you for being a board that makes decisions regardless of what's going on. Thank you for your leadership, Dr. Austin, and everyone in the district. And thank you for this acknowledgement. I truly appreciate it. Um, Ms. Schmidt, I just want to say, <laughs> as you walk away, this is fine. Um, your leadership during this crazy past few years we've had um, has been just so impressive and so inspiring. And every single time you and I have spoken, you have been laser focused on the students of our district, on the staff of our district, on the families and what they need at the time whether it's reopening schools or whether it's mandates or whether it's whatever it is, um, and been laser focused on equity. And it has been such a privilege to be going on this equity journey here in the district and to have PTAC going along with us, um, I think in a way that we aren't always as aligned. Um, and I really want to thank you for all of your service and for caring about all the right things. <laughs> thank you. I just want to reiterate, Christina, Dr. Austin's use of the word partner. Um, I can't tell you how wonderful it has been to have you as a partner this past two years. And really, the, I think of it as most respectful interpretation. When I think of you, you just embody that. You always have the most respectful interpretation. Even if you're frustrated and you're expressing your frustration, you're, you're always coming at it then looking immediately. I think of it as the lawyer and you. Looking immediately for the other side. Where's, where, where are they coming from? What's... What's, what's, the, um, what's the emotion that's driving this? And I've so appreciated problem solving with you. I mean, I just, how many times we've been on the phone think, talking through something that feels impossible and then we figure out a, way, a solution and a way to, to move forward. It's, so, it's been really inspiring. And I've never known another PTAC president on the board and I'm 
have to say I'm a little nervous. You have big shoes to fill for the partner role. So thank you so much. I'll, without repeating, I'll just say that you know the you you have you have done your role equal parts advocate and mediator, and it's a really difficult thing to do, especially when there are so many viewpoints and so many folks you're representing. It's hard enough when there are five of us, um, and you did it as as the president of PTEC, and and you did a great job. And as Jesse said, you know your your input and your insight into what was happening with our families is invaluable and has been invaluable for me as a board member in analyzing the issues that we do through the lens of those families whom you've been able to bring, uh, bring their voices to us. So thank you. So I, 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 won't, uh, I won't repeat what my colleague said, but I'll, I'll say a couple of other things, which is that, you know, Christina has been a, playing a leading role in the district uh, for a long time certainly for special education as a leader for the CAC. And I don't remember when I met Christina, but I do remember many phone calls about other difficult times in the district that we've gone through together and where she has been steadfast in support of the well-being of students. So thank you for all of that, Christina. And I also have to thank, uh, uh, sitting next to Christina, Stephen, because Christina is not the only member of her family who contributes to the district. Stephen is undoubtedly the longest serving uh, parent <laughs> member of the board policy review committee and has contributed in extraordinary uh, ways to the quality of the board policies that we've produced. So uh, thank you also to Stephen. Okay, thank you so much. Um, uh, that was a, a, a nice way to spend the, the last 20 minutes in recognizing the contributions of these extraordinary folks. Let's move on then to the next item on our agenda, which is the superintendent's report, Dr. Austin. I'll be, um, I'll be brief, but Mr. Dauber, um, you know, I think the Texas shooting is on everyone's mind. Um, we have principals who are uh, sending us draft messages that they'd like to send out tonight. We've told them all, go ahead. Uh, we'll have something out from tomorrow, but yeah, there's just there's so much, so much to process, and uh, you know I think the the hardest. I don't know if it's the hardest. I know what's first in my mind right now, is the fact that we're talking about another one. You know, it's I, I just I don't know. Um, I don't know. Yeah, tough one. Um, so when we get the right words down, we'll send them out. We don't have them right now. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to thank our school board members, and it's it's so fun. I get to meet with them before all of our meetings. We talk sometimes about the agenda and then other things. <laughs> and sometimes, well, we always touch the agenda. And these guys, they showed up prepared for every one of those meetings because they were prepared for our board meetings. They'd read the packets. I, I don't know. It's almost embarrassing how many times they asked me questions. I was like, huh, hey, Carolyn, can you come down and explain this? Uh, you know, hey, Sharon, can you spend some time? Which is so good that they, were, they, they got into it and also advocated for their school sites. They were part of discussions beyond this board table and led beyond this board table. It was really really enjoyed getting to know both of you. So thank you from, from my seat. Um, so our, our students across the district will graduate before our next meeting. And it it's, again, wasn't a normal year, but I think it was a, a massively important step in the transition back to to what's normal. You, you can't get to normal without having this year. And, and they did it. And when I mean they, I mean everybody. Everybody... You know, I've heard, well, this group's tired, this group's tired. Everyone's tired. You know, raise your hand if you're not. You know, everyone's tired, but they still, everyone got through it. And, and our students especially, you, for all of our students, it doesn't even matter what grade level you're at, you, you got a two, three-year life lesson in resiliency and not getting everything you want. You know, that's a good life lesson. You're not going to get everything you want. And sometimes you lost something kind of big. You know, I look back to a couple of years ago, you, 
you know, in the in the grand scheme of the universe, prom is not the most important thing, but it sure is when you're a junior and senior, and 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 you miss some of those things, um, like we talked about. You know, kids missed what it's like to share a sandwich with their buddy. You know, kids missed what it was like to just hold hands and and sit next to each other for a while. But you know, we're on a we're on a path back. And uh, I'm just really proud of everyone who was a part, of either contributing or going through um, this year. Uh, next year wouldn't be possible without the work that went into this year. So thank you to everybody. That's it. Thank you, Dr. Austin. Um, the next item on our agenda is open forum. Open forum is an opportunity for members of the community to address the board on topics that are not agendized for this evening. Um, you can uh, uh, speak to the board during open forum um, simply by registering your intent to do that. Um, on the, uh, and you can use the method that's in the agenda. Uh, what we typically do in order to get an accurate count, um, which then tells us how much time we can allot to each um, speaker, is to ask you to register your interest um, before the first speaker is finished. Um, so if anybody would like to speak to open forum, uh, please uh, go ahead and, and register that now. Um, the uh, We have 11 speakers for open forum, which I think means that we allocate two minutes per speaker. That, I think that's right. Um, so you'll see that on the timer uh, when you're speaking. Um, we have um, uh, a practice of uh, having students speak first uh, on uh during these opportunities for public comment. So, um, and we do have a, a couple of students, um, so I'll ask them to speak first and and then we'll go through the the list. So let's start with, uh, I have uh, Isaac and Janie Pratt have indicated that they're students and there's two slots. So I'm assuming one is Isaac and the other is Janie. So I'll have you come up. Oh, okay, well, you can. <laughs> As long as you're adjacent to a student, that's good enough. <laughs> okay. You want to start? Okay. So we're here because of Kids' Choice, um, which is being shrunk into two classrooms from three. Kids' Choice was struggling with having to deny a lot of kids uh, the opportunity to be in their program before they got the third classroom. And now we're being told that the third classroom is being taken away which is, means that some of us, some of these kids, won't be able to go to Kids' Choice. And when I told Isaac about this, he wanted to come and talk about what Kids' Choice meant for him and why it's important that any kid who wants to has the opportunity to join Kids' Choice, which means having a third classroom. So hold on, let me just, get, can we start a timer for Isaac now so that we make sure he gets the time? Okay, go ahead, Isaac. Thank you. So... One of the reasons why we should keep kids' choices as three classrooms is because not only will less kids be able to join, but less kids will be able to have, have like Legos and other things that are mainly at kids' choice. Kids' Choice has a lot of options that are indoors and outdoors. Lots of fun games outdoors, and lots of fun and board games and Legos and other toys raising games inside. Isaac's been in Kids' Choice since um, uh, he was in kindergarten. He loves it, he has friends. Uh, it's an opportunity for them to have a choice to do play after school. It's not more school. Mm -hmm. It's not more mm -hmm. education. And yet they learn how to cooperate. They learn how to play. And um, it's really important to him that he gets to continue in Kids' Choice next year and that other kids coming into the school will have that opportunity because it's been an incredible opportunity for him. Hmm. Yeah. Done? Hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Next uh, speaker is Jonathan Luck, who will be followed by Latika Hartman. Hi. 
Hi, um, I'm Jonathan Luke, um, a parent of an excellent kindergartner who attends Kids' Choice after school program. I was here two weeks ago, well, starting with exactly the same sentence, uh, hoping that the district will not cut down the enrollment of a well-loved childcare program, Kids' Choice, as we have just heard, and hoping that the district and the board will start listening to us parents, well, maybe instead of um, sending sometimes confusing, misleading, and maybe sometimes downright rude messages to some of the other parents. But that did not happen. In fact, it's as if nothing happened, so I'm here again after two weeks to make sure that you don't think I have forgotten and to make sure that you haven't forgotten this, even though obviously I would prefer to spend a Tuesday evening at home with my family. I'm here be because having a good childcare program means a lot to any working parent. I still remember really not that long ago, we were stressing over signing up for after school programs, that this Kids Choice program that uh, literally everyone was telling us about had a long wait list. And we were worried that we couldn't get in. We were so relieved when finally we got a spot for our son. And soon we found out how great this program has been. I'm so happy to see how much my son has grown over the past year, to see how he interacts and plays with other children, and to see how much the teachers cared about uh, the, the students. And it's not just us. Talking to other parents and even to friends who have slightly older kids, they all feel similarly. I do understand that perhaps the district wanted to introduce other things, and that's perfectly good. And we really wanted to believe that the district does all this out of pure intention, as our superintendent said two weeks ago. But please, here I would like to ask that while introducing any new programs, please do not cut the program that has worked uh, so well and so well loved. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Next is Latika Hartman, followed by Kelda Jameson. Hi, my name is Latika Hartman. Um, so I'm also here on behalf of Kids' Choice. Um, so I just want to say, uh, when we joined the district, my son uh, uh, was a second grader, and we had had experience with another childcare provider. And he couldn't. It was I always had to show up early to pick him up. He couldn't wait to leave. We come to Nixon. We enroll in Kids' Choice. It's a different world. Like if I show up at 5:30, Mom, why are you here? I'm not going to make eye contact with you. Just that's not my mother there and we're gonna wait till six. So I just wanna say, I really want PAUSB to treat all the child care providers equally, including our local providers. Currently, the district is planning to assign two classrooms to Kids' Choice, taking away the third classroom and perhaps assign two classrooms to right at school. Um, I just, if more parents want to enroll your kids in Kids' Choice, why are we taking that space away? We have neighbors who are coming back, their children cannot enroll in Kids' Choice because there's no space. Um, I just want the PAUSB to create a level uh, playing field. Um, there is, all the parents here are diverse, they have different demands. There is enough, why force parents, uh, when there's no supply constraint here, why not allocate the supply based on the demand of the parents, the choices of the parents? So Dr. Austin, you said in your video, right, like let's uh, let parents vote with their feet, and you were convinced that they would vote for right at school. Let's parent, I'm just asking you, let parents vote with their feet. So if parents decide they want to go to right at school, let them go to right at school. And if they want to go to Kids' Choice, let them go to Kids' Choice. So I think that's kind of all I wanted to say. And I really urge both the board and people at PAUSD, like I am a huge Warriors fan. I would not, I don't want to be here today. I want to be watching the Warriors game. And I'm here because like Neri and Lorraine are special. They are owner, they are there, like they own that place, they love the children, they can tell you stories about every child there. And I don't know about right at school as well, but generally um, organizations where the owners are a bit divorced from the people who do the day-to-day -day operations, they don't work quite the same way. So that's it, thank you. Thank you. Next uh, is Kelda Jameson, followed by Stephen Davis. Hello, um, I know that the board considers after school care decisions to be outside your bailiwick, and so I beg your patience and forbearance for listening to us one more time. We would like to know if Right at School and Kids Choice are considered by the district office to be equivalent program partners with the same licensing requirements for staff, safety, nutrition, et cetera, lease agreements with this district and the city, and is, is RAS considered an enrichment program as some of its advertising language indicates a child care provider or something else entirely? 
Have all providers been asked to develop program plans that align with state guidelines? If they haven't, will they be? Will PAC and KC proposals be met by the superintendent, whoever makes these decisions, with an eye to bringing everyone into alignment or with the intent of jettisoning some providers over others? I ask these questions because trust is low in the reasoning behind the district's avowed preference for right at school. I get that parents don't get a lot of things, far more than we know or are willing to acknowledge. And I get it that a lot of those things have to do with huge material inequalities and differential access to quality care for children in a place that's convenient and safe for them and their caregivers. But it is a combination of things that leaves many of us wondering what is behind the district's motivation. This is part of what makes it hard to trust the language then of equity and access pitched in terms of RES's ability to provide more program options in the absence of specification about what those options are. When I look at the guidelines for after-school programs, I see that they are meant to develop the academic, social, emotional, and physical needs of children through hands-on learning experiences that don't replicate the activities of the instructional day. I'm an anthropologist, not an educator, but I could sit down in detail for you right now the ways that Kids' Choice staff offer programs that meet the needs of those children in their care on exactly those lines. I would like to know what it is specifically, precisely, that Right at School offers that does this differently or better. I would like to know whether Kids' Choice and PAC will be given the opportunity to do better, in good faith and in full recognition that they are small and beloved institutions. The passion of parents is due to the emotional ties we have, but it is also, due, it is also because we feel that we've been offered a half dozen different reasons with very little concrete behind them. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next is Stephen Davis, followed by Julia Hartung. Good evening. Uh, I want to make two quick comments. First, I'd like to ask the uh, board to once again reconsider its decision to not uh, continue to allow online and other access to these meetings. Um, I've been active in disability stuff for only five years, and I've learned one thing. Uh, well, I'll probably learn more than one thing. Um, but uh, it's that when accessibility is optional, discrimination is the default. And these meetings are a privileged place. Only people who can take time off, who can come here and uh, leave their families behind can attend. I also know that what you do is an amazingly hard job, board members and actually everybody else too. Um, but that also that running for office is a privileged thing, that um, the uh, honoraria or whatever they call it that you get paid uh, in no way compensates you uh, for the amount of time and effort that is involved. Uh, we are at a time where our democracy is at great risk and anything that we can do to strengthen it uh, matters and that means making these meetings accessible. Two, uh, as a parent of a disabled child, I am very pleased to uh, have the uh, amazing support of the Palo Alto CAC, but I would like the board to consider creating a district advisory committee focused on disability and special education issues. It's an amazingly complicated set of topics uh, that needs sustained attention by both the community and, and uh, staff and board members and uh, should have the same attention that uh, the ELAC and other groups have. Thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll also point out that um, the board is planning to agendize the question of um, the use of Zoom for uh, meeting attendance at our next uh, board meeting, uh, which I think is June the 7th, June the 7th. So um, that agenda isn't finalized, but that's what I expect. So there'll be an opportunity to address the board and to hear the board discussion on that at that point. Um, next is Julia Hartung, followed by Stacy Ashland. Good evening, and thank you. I'm here on behalf of my husband and my two children, all in support of Kids Choice. We are Nixon parents, and our two kids have attended Kids Choice. My, our son since um, first uh, kindergarten four years ago and our daughter for the last two years. Much has been said about the outstanding care our children have received through Kids' Choice and Neri and Lorene's incredible dedication to providing that care. We agree with all that. What we want to comment on today instead is the enrichment program that Kids' Choice provides. We have been disheartened by the perception 
on the part of the board and Dr. Austin that has been conveyed that Kids' Choice somehow can't measure up to Ride at School in terms of the enrichment activities and programs it offers, as if Kids' Choice is just a child's child care service with no enrichment. That perception is inaccurate. While our daughter, Elise, did not feel comfortable addressing the board directly, she did permit me to share with you the book she just brought home from Kids' Choice. Titled, The Silliest Monkey in the World, this is a 24-page com story complete with character conversations and quotation marks even that was written and illustrated by Elise at Kids' Choice. We heard more about this book than anything she was working on at the time in her first grade class. Not to disparage what she's getting out of first grade. Both of our kids have brought home many things like this over the years. Nothing is broken, so please don't try to fix it. Please ensure that Kids' Choice can continue at current levels of operation. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next is Stacy Ashland, followed by Lisa Ratner. Thank you, board members. My name is Stacy Ashland, and I am the parent of two children who are young adults and have graduated from Palo Alto Unified School District. I would like to speak about parental notification of a resolution regarding the safe storage of guns and firearms in the homes. California has an Assembly Bill 452, which has passed out of the Assembly, which will mandate that all California school districts notify parents in those districts that safe storage of guns in the homes is required. It has passed through the Assembly, and hopefully the Senate will take it up as well. But there is no reason to wait. Both Sequoia Union High School District, just north of here, and Mountain View Wisman School District, just south of here, are just two of our nearest school boards to have already passed such a resolution. Individual board members in the last fall have recommended that PTA Council notify parents of this responsibility. And we have also put that request directly to PTA Council, and we're told that they would do so if and when the school board supports it. Given that it is estimated that 30 to 35 percent of the homes in Santa Clara counties and San Mateo counties have at least one gun in the home, and that it is estimated that 80 percent of school shootings are perpetrated by an unsecured gun found in the home or the home of a family member. So just like Palo Alto Unified notifies parents of the dangers faced by children with peanut allergies who are exposed to food containing peanuts in the schools, we are simply requesting that the school district also notify parents every year of their responsibilities in keeping all of our children safe from guns in our schools. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Lisa Ratner, followed by Aaron Winkler. Is Lisa Ratner here? Doesn't, doesn't look like it. We'll, we'll come back to Ms. Ratner before we uh, finish open forum. So then it's Aaron Winkler, uh, followed by Sara Woodham. Hello. Uh, so yeah, so something about this kid's choice thing just doesn't make sense to me, right? There's a, clearly a lot of parents who care, like really, really care. And what they're asking for seems like a no-brainer. Um, so there's something about it, uh, about trying to take the classroom away. You could just let them have it. It doesn't hurt anything. It doesn't cost anything. Um, and we're all definitely on the same team. Like, I know that, right? We all are only here because we care about kids' ed education, right? I know none of you are here for any other reason, and uh, I'm certainly not here for any other reason, and we all feel strongly about today's news, right? We're all in agreement about a lot of things. We're all definitely on the same team, so there's got to be something else. I'm trying to figure it out. I'm thinking maybe there's just like a built-in adversarial thing, right? Maybe parents are going to be demanding and school board's admin, admins are going to have to say no about stuff, and maybe parents are going to be annoying, and you all are going to be the people doing the work sometimes, right? Well, okay, so if there's just some built-in adversarialness, let's maybe just manage it in a healthier way, right? So, I mean, I have an idea. This could be fun new business. I don't know how to officially do that, but it could be fun. I say we get a gym, one of the high school gyms, one of the junior high gyms. We can sell popcorn, make it a fundraiser, and let's do a... Admins and school board versus parents dodgeball game. <laughs> you, you think I'm kidding. I'm not kidding. It sounds like a lot of fun. And you can pelt us with dodgeballs, and we can pelt you with dodgeballs. 
and the kids can yell and scream and have a really nice time. I mean, that, I don't, that actually sounds like a really nice time to me. Um, and then maybe you can just let Kids' Choice have the classroom, and I can be reading to my kids right now instead of being here, right? Anyway, thanks. Thank you. Next is Sara Woodham, followed by Amelia Creamer. Hi. Um, I'd actually like to talk about the, and actually, can you just mention that it's going to come up? So, I don't know, I'm going to say this anyway, that the business about not being able to call in comments. Mm -hmm. So I'll just, I'll just keep going, like you never said it. Okay. It's not agendized tonight, so it's fine, Ms. Woodham. To All right, <laughs> sounds good. Um, <laughs> It, to me, it's always been sort of inequitable that the only way for us to speak out was to be here in person at dinner time waiting for an item to be called, um, to be able to speak at board meetings. Thanks to COVID, we pivoted and we allowed remote comments into board meetings. Yesterday, I was pretty surprised, if not shocked, to realize that this option had actually been summarily removed, no public discussion. Apparently, it's coming. It's just gone. Anyway, <clears throat> there is inherent, I'll just for point of emphasis, because I'm not sure I'm going to be back in another two weeks. Um, there's inherent disproportionality in the burden that this decision not to have uh, remote comments place, places on families. As a stay-at-home mom in the two-parent household, I live just about a mile away. I myself have found it difficult sometimes to show up on Tuesdays prepared to sit for however long just to make a three-minute comment. Um, this dif difficulty is disproportionately harder for many socially, so socioeconomically disadvantaged parents and families. As a case point, um, Dreamcatcher's organization has built up a parent engagement program, which is designed to help parents be better advocates for their kids in the classroom, right up to the board level. It's working. And parents have responded, knowing, and in part, knowing that they don't have to be here in person. Several of them actually have called in over the last few years. And in fact, I was giving guidance on how to do that yesterday when I realized the option didn't exist anymore. So that's how I found out, by scouring the board packet. I'd just like you to appreciate that besides Ms. the- Ms. Willem, that, that, that's ah, your time. Okay. Yeah. But we'll look forward to hearing from you at our next Maybe meeting I'll on this topic. Okay. All right, uh, next is Amelia Creamer, and then we'll come back to Lisa Ratner to see if she's uh, here. Hello, my name is Amelia Creamer. I am a recent graduate from Gunn High School in the class of 2020, and today I'd like to speak about the now over one year old city ordinance requiring guns be stored, unloaded, and securely locked. Given today's tragedy in Texas, Texas, it is now more than ever imperative that parents are notified of their legal and moral responsibility to ensure that any and all guns in the home are stored safely and securely. As I recently graduated, I am acutely aware of the terrifyingly frequent lockdown drills that I and other students have to go to, go through. We deserve to be able to feel safe in our schools and Therefore, I request that the school board take our safety into consideration and notify the parents in our district of their legal and moral duties. Thank you. Thank you. So our next speaker is, is coming back to Lisa Ratner to see if she is here. Not seeing her, that concludes um, open forum. And the next item on our agenda is the approval of the consent calendar. Uh, items on the consent calendar are uh, approved all at once without discussion, except that if a member of the community or a board member wants to discuss an item, then we pull it from the consent calendar and put it on our action agenda for separate consideration and discussion. Um, the, I don't have any comments uh, for uh, items on the consent calendar from members of the community, um, board members. I'd like to move that we approve the consent calendar as presented. Second. So it's been moved and seconded that we approve the consent calendar as presented. Um, student board members, preferential vote? Aye. Aye. Board members, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The items on the consent calendar are approved. The next item on our agenda is the first of our action items, which is um, item 5A, the authorization to award contract for the Gunn High School Temporary Administration Facility. Um, and uh, this is... Uh, is Mr. Holmes, uh, Ms. Chow, do you want gonna, are you going to start us off? 
Yes, um, Mr. Hodges will be presenting these uh, next three items on our action uh, uh, agenda for the for this evening as Mr. Holm is uh, out of country. Okay, great, Mr. Hodges. Good evening, everyone. So the first uh, project we have is the uh, construction of the temporary administration facility at Gunn High School. Uh, we received four bids on May 10th, and we are recommending awarding a contract to Ron Paris Construction, and this will be their first project with the district. I'll take any questions. Any comments or questions from board members? Mr. Collins? Uh, I move that we authorize staff to award the contract as presented. So it's been moved and seconded that we authorize the contract as presented. Is there any further discussion or questions? Student board members, preferential vote? Aye. Aye. Board members, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Um, next is item B, authorization to award a contract for the uh, Palo Alto High School Temporary Administration Facility. Yes. So similarly, just uh, bid this project on May 12th. We only did receive one bid. Uh, that was from Zone 4 Construction um, for about $620,637. Uh, got no uh, other bidders, no bid protests. Um, seems like a good firm, and they're working with us to try to uh, cut some of the cost out of the project. So we're recommending we award at this amount, and we are trying to uh, get some money out of this one. Okay. Comments or questions? Uh, I move that we authorize staff to award the contract as presented. Is there a second? Okay. So it's been moved and seconded that um, we authorize the award the contract as recommended. Board members, uh, student board members, preferential vote? Aye. Aye. Board members, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Next is uh, item 5C, authorization to award a contract for the Palo Verde multipurpose room and classroom buildings. Yes, so this one we uh, bid on May 10th, and we had three bidders. Uh, this is for construction of a new multi-purpose building and a new classroom wing at Palo Verde Elementary. Um, Sossel Construction was the low bidder. Uh, they've done three projects with the district recently, including what JLS, uh, the Pali Library modernization, and the Addison project. So we're very happy with this bid, and uh, we did have a bid protest, but that was resolved very quickly. So we recommend an award to Sossel. Okay. Board members, comments or questions? Uh, I move that we authorize staff to award the contract as presented. A second. Uh, student board members, preferential vote on that motion? Aye. Aye. Board members, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you for uh, your presentations. Next item on our agenda is item uh, 5D, the declaration of need for emergency and limited assignment permits for 2022-23. And uh, let's see, is this? This will be Mr. Bahadur Singh. Mr. Bahadur Singh. Yes, um, real quick. This is the annual document that's required by uh, the state of California for local education ag agencies. It's uh, basically a prerequisite to the is issuance of any emergency permit and or a limited assignment permit. So basically what the state requires us to do is to estimate any of those types of permits we think that we will possibly need in the upcoming year. Uh, again, it is an estimate and it requires if we exceed that amount, we would they would also ask us to come back for any additional beyond that. So um, this is kind of a standard practice for all school districts in the state of California. Any questions or comments on this one? I have a question. Yep. Um, in the past, we've uh, had issues with in special education with um, teachers with uh, mild to moderate certificates uh, having to cover Montsevier classes, mm -hmm. and um, and as we all know, that's a challenge for both the teachers and non and suboptimal for the students. Um, how do have we been able to address that? Are we looking for to yeah. authorize people outside of their specialty? We are looking to we uh, we we felt that this year we had a, um, a less of a, a demand for those open positions. Uh, in the last uh, few weeks, we have had some uh, vacancies that we are working on to fill now. But we uh, anticipate that we'll be able to fill those with highly qualified teachers with the proper credentials, and we'll work on making sure that that uh, every, all, every effort we can to make sure we have. 
the properly uh, certified credentials folks for those classes. Great, thank you. Um, so this item is up for action. I can't recall if we discussed it at our last uh, meeting under discussion. So, Dr. Roth, it sounds no, like we, we we saw this as a routine activity that takes place every every year. So that's why it's here for action. The board could see it differently. Uh, it's fine with me to, to correct go ahead with it. I just Mr. Wanna... Broderson. <laughs> yeah, we put it. Um... I know last year there was some discussion about it, so um, we can bring it back uh, as a consent. We brought it a little earlier this year. Last year was brought in June, so we brought it a little earlier, so in case there was any. I mean, we we can also, uh, if there's a motion uh, to waive the two meeting rule, we could waive the two meeting rule and just take care of it tonight. That's uh, fine too. So moved. Is there a second? I'll second. So it's been moved and seconded that we may waive the two meeting rule to uh, take up this item tonight. Any discussion? Student board members, preferential vote. Aye. Aye. Board members, all in favor? Aye. Aye. So the two meeting rules waived. Is there a motion on the? Uh, I move that we approve the declaration of need as presented. Is there a second? I'll second. So it's moved and seconded to approve the declaration of need. Um, student board members, preferential vote? Aye. Aye. Board members, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Let's. <laughs> Uh, that concludes our action items, so we'll move on to the, um, that was the last vote. That was the last vote? Oh, my God. Right <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah, a memorable one. Uh, next is uh, the first of our discussion items, which is uh, um, 6A uh, MOU with the City of Palo Alto regarding an easement on uh, Churchill Avenue. Um, Ms. Chow, is this yours? Yes, it is. Thank you, President Dauber. So this item is coming to the board this evening as a discussion item. And I just wanted to clarify, since there's actually three projects on Churchill Avenue that are led by the city, this is a project that um, pertains to the granting of the easement along Churchill Avenue. And the purpose of the project is to increase pedestrian and bicycle safety along Churchill Avenue, and namely at the uh, intersection at El Camino Real. Some uh, highlights of the safety improvements include a removal of that pork chop island that uh, currently is out on El Camino and creation of a dedicated right turn lane for vehicles from Churchill onto El Camino. And this is the section uh, at the top of the diagram that runs parallel to the district office. Also is enhanced bicycle and pedestrian crosswalks at all three intersection crossings on the El Camino. Extension of the existing bicycle path from Castalea Avenue uh, down to the Stanford Perimeter Trail. High visibility crosswalks at Castalea Avenue. A raised crosswalk and a speed table at Madrano Avenue. And then repaving and restriping the entirety of Churchill Avenue. Uh, another important part that has had uh, quite a bit of discussion on the project is replacing seven existing trees with 15 newly planted trees. The ask from the city is that the district grant an easement of approximately nine feet wide along Churchill, running from the school entrance at Castalea, which is the uh, entrance at the Pally Field entrance, um, west to the El Camino. The city is responsible for the entire design of the project and the cost of the project. The district would be responsible for maintaining any new landscaping and watering the newly planted trees. I, I'd like to thank Ms. Komi Vishakan and the team from the city for their collaboration on this project. And this project is scheduled to go to city council at the June 20th uh, council meeting. Okay, uh, and we and it's noted in the item that we saw this before a little over a year ago, and we might have seen it before then actually. Um, uh, so it's been a, it's been a while. Um, comments or questions from board members? Yep, Mr. Branza. No questions. Just thank you to everyone for bringing it forward. I know this has been in the works for a very very long time. I'm excited to see it and look forward to these improvements. I mean, you know, we it's too often that we hear of some tragedy happening or some near tragedy happening and. If this can make it safer to connect those two separate bike paths, then I'm all in. 
Thanks. Any, anyone else? Okay, thank you so much for that. Let's move on to our next, um, and we'll see this at our next uh, board meeting for action. And the next item on our agenda is the evaluation of external legal firms. Um, and this is Ms. Vashakin. Ms. Thank Vashakin. You. Thank you, Mr. Dover. Um, this is an item we bring each year um, uh, as per our board bylaw 9124. We are, we are required to evaluate our external law firms who pro you know, provide um, specialized legal advice, especially in special education um, and other matters. Um, so we're required to evaluate them on four criteria, reasonableness of fees and quality of the advice and responsiveness, um, and the results that they obtain for the districts. So, um, three parties are supposed to do this evaluation, the board, the superintendent, and the general counsel. So we do seek feedback and evaluate them. The ratings are shown on the board item. Um, we've also outlined the names of the attorneys that we work with, as well as the name of the firms and what sort of areas that they provide advice in. And you can actually see the ratings that we've provided. I, I personally clo work closely with any, all of these attorneys, so I would be um, um, I'm satisfied with the services that they provide, and then we would be requiring them um, soon. We'll be asking that their contracts be renewed. Um, these firms were chosen after an RFP process two years ago um, in 2020, and we'll have the next RFP process in 2023, next year. So that's when they will be up for another new bidding process. So overall, um, we are satisfied um, with the services. Um, if, unless you have any other questions for me, that's from me. That's all from me. Okay, and so we'll... Uh... And we'll be bringing this back for action at the next meeting for satisfactory evaluations or not, depending on what the board wants That's to do. That's correct. Yeah. Uh, comments or questions from board members? Anyone? Okay, thank you for that, and we'll see this again at the next meeting then. Um, that concludes our discussion items. Um, next is uh, uh, item 7A, which is a staff report on adult school highlights. And I'd like to bring up our adult school principal, Tom Keating. And come on up, Tom. And, and uh, we're, we're excited to share some things. And we, we just finished our evaluations of all principals. And that is not just an evaluation, it's a conversation. And every time we meet with Tom to hear about the adult school, we say to ourselves, we need to share some of this. There, there's some really good things that are happening there. So we've asked Tom to just do a, a, a brief highlight for us. and. Uh, Tom had transitioned into his position from uh, Pally High School, and it's just hit the ground running and has added value and just built on a program that was already successful, and we really appreciate his efforts. So, Tom, thank you. Did you get enough of that? You probably, I'm pretty loud as a teacher. So it was, it's basically been an, uh, one of the highlights of my varied career, which I can share with you sometime. Um, <laughs> we have three signature programs, preschool families, uh, community education, and English as a second language. This past year, uh, we we're going to celebrate a 75 year anniversary of preschool family, and we also a 100 year anniversary of the adult school. Uh, in general, our community courses. However, pandemic has not allowed us to do so. We're hoping perhaps to be able to do it in the fall. If that doesn't happen, I think we're gonna have to wait to the next 100 years. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, just looking at our numbers though, you know, we all, uh, we had to uh, really pull in tight before I got there uh, with the pandemic. And you'll see as we move through the last four years that there was quite a dip last year. But this year we've made a, a really nice rebound, I think, and, and working with my colleagues at other adult schools, uh, we've been fortunate that we could guarantee the safety of our students and get folks back into the classroom. Also, uh, we've continued on with online. We learned that there was some real value in some of the online uh, uh, sections of courses we had. So now we have a, a really a rich mix and we reach out to uh, touch more people. Uh, we have one Spanish teacher who has a section uh, 
online where he has people in New Zealand, South Africa, all over the world. And whenever I come by, he says, Tom, say hello to every, all my students out there. So I wave into the Zoom camera. It's really quite extraordinary. Um, pardon, me, pardon me, let's see. There we go. Uh, preschool family uh, is a really quite a unique and uh, a honored program. It's centered upon parent participation coupled with parent education courses in the evening, hence the adult school piece of it. And it's all based around play. And I've had the pleasure of going and playing with the kids with the wooden train track, the, the toddlers, uh, reliving my childhood. And then in the evening, attending with the parents to learn about raising children. And with that, supporting each other and forming community. And if there's one thing I've seen coming to the adult school, it's all about authentic community and communities that thrive around uh, these different programs. Uh, likewise, English as a Second Language program, and I, sh I wish you could see these pictures of the diversity of the students that are here. We have uh, two different sections. During the day, they're at Greendale School, uh, moving over to Coverly, and it's made up of a, really a, a diverse mix of folks affiliated with Stanford that uh, speak other languages and maybe have family at Stanford. Uh, au pairs from all over the world. Uh, and then in the evening, we have the working folks that are looking to improve their language skills and move through and be a master's language and also take advantage of some more advanced classes. Uh, and I put this, I know this is a, I, I'm been talking about PowerPoint to a class, and this is not a very good PowerPoint class, but I hope it just communicates the diversity of the languages of people that are there. It's, it's amazing. Uh, in fact, come by and visit all these great folks uh, someday. And the different backgrounds, you have everything from no education to Stanford postdocs that are in trying to improve their English language skills. The job backgrounds, equally diverse, uh, and folks looking to improve their language for a great number of reasons. This uh, program is state and federally funded to the tune of about $2 million a year. We're part of a consortium of uh, adult schools in the community colleges. We have uh, Foothill College, De Anza College, Mountain View, Los Altos School District, Fremont Di uh, School District. And we work in uh, tandem to try to support students to uh, be able to transition to the university or to the college and ultimately, hopefully, the university and to different work programs. And our 100-year-old program is the uh, Community Education Program. I decided to put three pictures up there that talk about some of our uh, really well-established programs that people were so looking forward to returning to given the pandemic. And two of those together right there is a dual project around uh, woodworking and upholstery. And Dr. Austin and uh, Vicki and Victoria came and visited one day to see the upholstery class. And there are folks there that take these courses over and over again, have long-term projects. Uh, one of my interests when I was at the university was project-based learning and design learning, and these definitely epitomize the kind of really rich learning that we'd like to see happen in classrooms, and this is happening with, in the adult communities. Uh, in fact, it'd be nice to get woodworking into the curriculum of the high school. Um, the other being, we have real, uh, uh, some, some great uh, uh, orchestras and a taiko drumming uh, program. Uh, we have the Master Symphonia that's going to be giving a chamber orchestra uh, concert Saturday night at the PAC, and the PAC's a great place to hear music. And we also have the Peninsula Symphonic Band and the taiko drumming. So I went to see the taiko drumming, I, sleep, I went to all the performances, but I went to taiko drumming, and this was one of the most incredible things I've seen. Now, when I was younger, I spent a lot of time at Winterland in San Francisco at rock concerts. Some of the Pali uh, grads were in some of those bands. And I have to say that taiko performance by our students and some of the other students in the area was just over the top. So I would like to invite the board and everybody else to come and uh, take advantage of that. And I'll get that info to you. And then uh, our languages program is uh, World Languages. We're one of the premier programs of adult schools probably in the country, diversity of languages. Uh, again, the thing that's interesting is that you see communities forming around these courses so that people just don't take language once. They take it sometimes for five, ten years because they want to be with those people and keep improving and hanging out together. And I think that there's any lesson is having a rich place to learn something with like-minded people is a really powerful thing that we need to nurture in society in as many places as we can. And I think the adult school really epitomizes that. 
Uh, part of my work this year has been trying to think about partnerships. Some of these were established, like our uh, child development program at Pali that comes over to the preschool family and works with the kids. And, works, and they get uh, dual enrollment credit with the community colleges, and they can get a certificate and go out and get a job after they're done. And I have to give credit to Hillary, who runs that program. It's just a nice partnership in showing that ways that we can internally in the district and externally out to the community. Um, and Alta Housing, we have an MOU with. They're going to, uh, they just built some um, um, assisted uh, or uh, living uh, spaces for the community. They're going to take about, I think, 100 people in the fall. They're going to provide us with a space there to have a satellite to, one, we can uh, hold courses for their people free and then we and provide services, and we can also use it as a place to offer our ESL classes or anything that we think would be useful to the community. So that should be uh, keep you updated. Uh, one of the things I wanted to do since I got here was to try to get a, an environmental stewardship theme going in adult school. So we've been able to partner with environmental volunteers that are over in the Baylands, uh, giving, uh, hoping to give some actual courses, but they're leading hikes. And I'll tell you more about the hikes in a minute. And then Actera is a new one, which is Action for a Healthy Planet. And they're going to teach three courses for us in the fall. And lastly, and the one I'm really excited about, is the uh, pilot health and well-being course that we had for employees. And this came out of uh, what Dr. Austin was talking about. We had a meeting for, and it was a check-in. And that was really refreshing as a, a, a teacher and an administrator hey, this was a conversation about what's going on and, 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 and ideas. And I came away filled with a lot of ideas. And it was Dr. Austin that said, hey, Tom, you know, couldn't we take some of the classes you have in the adult school and offer them for free to our staff? And I thought, yeah, that's a, that's a great idea. So I got together with Trent. We talked about it and said, let's do a pilot. So in that pilot, we came up with Belgian chocolate making, uh, Zumba workout, environmental volunteers, hikes. Now, the Belgium chocolate making is taught by one of our uh, district uh, instructors. Turns out that she's from South Africa, and then she studied being a chocolatier in Belgium. Uh, her class is off the charts for people being engaged and having fun. I'm a science educator. I learned about the uh, curve for tempering chocolate, the melting point of chocolate, and how to, to work with that. So a little chemistry was in there. I mean, this is really, uh, what do you want to say, uh, situated learning. It's good stuff. <laughs> Zumba workout, uh, again, was a huge success. I have the evaluation data. Maybe someday I can come share some of the evaluation, evaluation data we have in all our programs. And then uh, lastly, uh, the series of hikes. So being a pilot, we're going to get together, uh, you know, probably this summer and try to think, how can we grow this? What are, where are some of the, what's the context? How do we, uh, what's appropriate? But uh, the folks that have participated have been overwhelmingly positive. And it's been a good opportunity for us. So with that, I'll take any questions. Um, thank you. Before we take questions, I, I want to apologize because I missed a speaker on the, um, on the easement MOU. And so uh, I, I should probably offer uh, oh, okay. Liz Gardner an opportunity to speak now, uh, even though the, the item has passed. Is Ms. Gardner here? Uh, not seeing her. I'll, uh, I'll send an email apologizing to her because I have her email here. Um, and uh, questions and comments on adult school? Just to thank you. Really nice to hear the update. Thanks for all your work. Mr. Okay. Collins, yeah. yeah, and I, I similarly want to thank you for that great presentation. My wife is a, a member of the Frequent Flyer Club of the World Language Department um, and one of those people who keep coming back for more and has found a real home and community of yeah. Italian speakers, of all things, at the, at the adult school. And, uh, you know, raves about the quality of the, her experience there and the instruction. So I, I, I can tell you I hear about it. I hear about it here. I also hear it about it at the dinner table. And I think it is a, uh, a real extraordinarily positive program for the community. Yeah, I can't say enough for the staff and the instructors that were employed by the district. They're just their dedication and that they love what they do. And the uh, students that come, they love what they do because they choose to do it. And it's, it's just a really delightful educational environment. Yet, yet another hidden gem in the Palo Alto community. Perhaps our board president can reach out to you to organize Belgium chocolate making as a forum for the next board retreat. I, I can help you out on that one. Fantastic. 
anybody else? Well, I've I've definitely taken a few woodworking classes and other cooking classes at the adult school over the years, so I appreciate the work that you're doing and. and Second, the idea that it's definitely a hidden gem for the district. So thanks. And one of our woodworking instructors is the uh, chair of the biochemistry uh, department at Stanford, and he comes here to teach and relax. So. <laughs> That's terrific. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, next item on our agenda is um, uh, information items. So these are items that uh, are provided on the agenda, but we don't uh, have staff reports, um, although we can have uh, comments or questions. if board members or members of the community uh, want to speak to any of these items. We do have one um, speaker on item um, 8A, which is the equity impact report, um, and that is uh, Stephen Davis, Mr. Davis. Good evening again. Um, I'd like to speak briefly to the equity impact report. Um, we spent a lot of time talking about talking about uh, the importance of equity and diversity. Uh, and I took a look at the content of this report, and I ask that you do too and take it seriously. Um, I was really disappointed. Uh, it opened up with basically, it's a 16 page document, I would call seven pages of front end boilerplate, followed by nine pages of um, bureaucratic bullet point accomplishments that there is no way to fail at. Uh, and buried in there in the middle is a modest 3% increase improvement per year. And these are in the areas where we are supposed to be addressing our weaknesses. So 3% uh, improvement a year is probably not what we should be going for. But perhaps more importantly is there's none of the data about our district in that report. Uh, no hard data. Uh, I got mailed uh, something from California, uh, the California, uh, was it Reading Association? Uh, coalition, sorry, uh, at careads.org. And it finds that uh, using California's data, not their data, that um, socioeconomically disadvantaged Latino third graders uh, in our state are ranked 279 out of 287. Okay, that's not my number and presumably that's, that's not their number, that's the state number that is cited as a bullet that will pull state numbers but they don't actually pull them. Uh, they don't pull any of the special ed numbers which I would usually go on and on about but what I don't see is real numbers about how we're doing and then real ambitious goals for doing better. And um, this is kind of the report, I've, I used to be a bureaucrat a long, long time ago, uh, that people would write when they didn't want to do the job but they had to do a job. They'd uh, have no ambitious goals, they'd have nothing to be held accountable, and that's what this report looks like, and I hope that's not what we'll be seeing. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Durrell. Thank you. Um, Ms. Conway, I want to thank you for this report, and I will, uh, I'd like to refresh the collective recollection of, of how we got here, because I think we spent an extraordinary amount of time, and specifically staff spent an extraordinary amount of time putting this report together. It was a, it was a year-long process, but it was a culmination of, I would say, you know, decades of the district getting to a place where the board not only prioritized equity, which it's done for, for years, but got to a place where we said to staff, let's create an aligned framework so that we can look at a document and say, what initiative are we undertaking to meet this goal where we know that our underserved students are failing, who is responsible so that we as the board can hold those individuals responsible or, or the superintendent can hold those individuals responsible, and what are the specific action steps that are going to be taken over the next year, over the next two years to reach that goal or to make progress towards that goal, and how is the board going to measure that progress? That's not something we had in this district ever before. Um, to me, it is phenomenal that we are here. Uh, again, I, I want to recognize the amount of work that's gone into this. 
I don't think this is a bureaucratic document. In fact, I look at this as someone who reads many documents as, as a litigator. And I see this as a very detail-oriented document that provides us with a great deal of oversight and direction. So a big thank you to you and the team. Um, this is exactly the document that I envisioned. Well, it's better than the document I envisioned when we voted to form the committee, when Ms. Light America and I came on to, to sort of steward that um, staff work. And the board approved it because it was exactly the thing we need to incorporate within our promised goals of equity. So a uh, big thank you. And it's, it's very gratifying to see it in its full step. And of course, as we know, this is not the end of the work. It's truly the beginning of the work, but it is a more uh, foundational beginning than I think we've ever had. So thank you. Mr. Branza. I kind of want to echo Mr. Drop's comments. Um, Ms. Conway and all of staff, thank you for being bold. Thank you for doing significant work on equity. Um, I think that, that we really are well positioned now to make progress. And I think that this document also acknowledges how hard that work is <laughs> when you're trying to move a system, some of whom are dying to do the work and some of whom are really trying not to do the work and some of whom are still questioning what the work is. Um, and to bring along a whole system is hard to do. And I am really pleased with the progress we've made. Thank the, the um, board members who sit on the Board Equity Oversight Committee and the staff members as well. Um, and look forward to really, like, you know, blowing past all this and, you know, keep going, you know, figure out what's next. So thank you. Other comments? Uh, any comments on any of the other information items on the agenda? Nothing, okay. Then the next item on our agenda is um, board operations. Any um, May I? comments or um, reports? Mr. Branza, go ahead. Um, I'm gonna skip over the what I've done over the past two weeks as a board member and just go right to um, how you started our meeting, Mr. Dauber, about the horrific shooting in Texas and who knows how many that is in the past you know, 10 years. Um, and, and the reason I wanted to bring it up on board operations is because I know that last year the city council passed a safe storage ordinance. And I know that we actually brought this topic up last year and we felt like it wasn't really directly at our purview, right? That it was, if it was education to parents, then maybe PTAC would do it or, or whatnot. Um, and I think a couple of things have come to my mind today as I sat here, you know, trying to pull myself up off of the floor and, and come here tonight. Um, one of which being that PTAC has been very clear in that they will advocate for things that we express an interest in them advocating for, and we have not weighed in on that issue yet. So for that reason alone, I think it may be worth us considering either passing a resolution or making a statement or something. Um, and the other thing is that I, I don't know if us making sure that families know about the safe storage ordinance is going to save any lives, but I do know that if God forbid any of any gun violence happens in our town and with our families and students, I want to know that we did everything we could have to prevent it. So um, as much as these horrific stories are what dominate the news, what is a more common way for a child or a teenager to be killed or injured by a gun? Is it not being safely locked up and either a toddler getting their hands on it and killing themselves or someone else or a teenager getting their hands on it and doing themselves harm or sometimes doing other people harm? Um, so if everyone in our town and in our county and in our state was actually safely storing their, their firearms so that no one could get them except for the attended person, I think it would be a lot harder for these things to happen. Um, so I want to make sure that we're doing everything we can, and um, I want to make sure that if PTAC needs a, some sort of stamp of approval from us to do some education themselves, that we also give that to them. So I would like to maybe agendize what our role is here, what we could, what meaningful action we could take soon. Okay, we can definitely take that up in agenda setting. Um, any other reports or comments for board operations? Nothing. Okay, so that, I think, uh, concludes our agenda, and we are adjourned. Thank you.